Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties with the music. We really wanted to have music today as we do every Monday when we have a Let Us Introduce You event. Uh, welcome to week four squad and Keeney Recovery participants. It's great to see you. Um, we're moving through the summer and um, my name is Nava Renick and I'm the program coordinator at the Women's Center. Uh, at least once a week or more than once a week, we bring you really interesting people who are doing interesting stuff, um, often uh, in Brooklyn and sometimes in New York City and sometimes around the country. And um, today I'm going to pass it over to uh, your fellow squad member, Salita Flowers, who is going to introduce our speakers. So Salita, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction, Nava. Um, like Nava said, my name is Solita, and I am a squad member here at the Women's Center at Brooklyn College. And today we are here for a, a continuation in the uh, Let Me Introduce You To series. Um, and today I have the honor, the pleasure of moderate, moderating today's event um, and in conversation with Susanna Las Caras and Periana, Periana Pironi, um, two local green space community activists and educators who I'm sure will learn a lot from today. Um, now, before we get to our event, I have a couple quick bits of logistics and housekeeping things to go over so we can make this a great experience for everyone. Um, please make sure that you keep yourself muted during the session. Um, also, while it's not mandatory and while you don't have to, we'd love it if you can turn on your video. We recognize everyone has a crazy, a chaotic life and things are always going on in the background, but we appreciate you sharing your private space with us. We appreciate seeing your face. So if you can, please turn on your camera. And also please feel free to um, use reaction functions during the session. It energizes us, lets us know where we are, it lets our speakers know um, how you're feeling. So. Also, if you have questions while they're in conversation, please put the questions in the in the chat and we'll get to them in the Q&A section. Um, now, like I said earlier, our today today's event is a conversation with Susanna and Periana, and I'm now going to hand it over to them to let them tell um, to let them tell you about themselves and their works. Susanna and Periana. Everyone. Um, Thank you so much, Solita, for that um, lovely introduction. You do indeed have a great presence, and it's not easy on Zoom. Um, so I'm really excited to be here um, with um, members of the squad and CUNY Recovery Corps. It's great to meet you. I'm Pierana Pieroni, and um, I am the director of the College Now program at Brooklyn College, um, where I've been working for about 30 years and have also been involved, as Solita said, in a lot of greening around the community and greening education. Um, I am actually going to start, though, by not talking about me, but by introducing my friend and colleague and partner in um, mischief, Susanna Lascaris. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her, and um, I think then she's going to tell you a little bit about me, and then we'll have a conversation about how we met and how we've been collaborating in the community. So um, I officially met Susanna about 10 years ago. Um, when, when she came to the rescue of me and a group um, of, of folks who were doing um, some work in the community and, and kind of ran afoul of the powers that be, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But even before I met Susanna officially, I saw her impact in the community over a span of several decades, um, which when I thought about it as I was thinking about how to introduce her, really kind of blows my mind. Um, so. If you can imagine, I came to Brooklyn College as a student in the 80s, um, before a lot of the folks in this room were born. And at that time, um, I used to take the bus to Brooklyn College and it used to leave me off in front of Midwood High School, which is right across the street from Brooklyn College. And right across the street from Midwood High School was a huge parking lot, which was always full of cars, which presumably belonged to teachers who taught at Midwood High School. And it would be full all day with cars. And it was kind of a shame because it was one of the very few 
outdoor spaces um, that's not developed in the whole area around Brooklyn College other than the Brooklyn College campus. And the Brooklyn College campus was essentially, as you know, just like it is today, closed to the community. You have to sign in or you have to buy a community pass to come onto Brooklyn College campus. And there are very, very few um, spaces for children to play or just for a place to sit and, and hang out with your friends or read or um, you know skateboard or what have you. We did not have that in our in our whole neighborhood at that time. Um, some years later, when I started working at Brooklyn College, I noticed that that parking lot was now a playground, um, a schoolyard playground. So there would be children playing in it um, during the day, um, which was a big improvement over um, cars in a parking lot. But um, it wasn't really open to the community, at least not yet. By the time I officially met Susanna, and she can give you a better timeline on this, but it seems to me that by the time I met her like 10 years ago, that schoolyard across from Midwood High School had become a community playground. And so it was being used outside the school day um, by members of the community uh, whenever school wasn't in session. And Susanna um, was actually starting to plan a garden there. And she had been working on this by then um, for like 15 years, right? To get that area changed. And she, she can tell you how through, through, you know, incredible efforts through the community board, through um, reaching out to public electeds, through all kinds of organizing people together in community. She gradually got that changed from a parking lot to a schoolyard, to a playground. Um, and last year on Labor Day weekend in the midst of the pandemic, when people in, in this neighborhood and, and Susanna and I both live in walking distance to, to the college, we are, we are members of this, of this neighborhood, of this community. Um, on Labor Day, that schoolyard to playground opened up as a brand new $2 million, fully renovated, gorgeous um, community gathering space with basketball courts, a uh, running track, a beautiful garden um, with raised beds and um, you know water spigots, um, places to sit in the shade and gather, um, a little outdoor teaching space, um, a shed to store tools so you can have a real teaching garden there. And it's open to the community whenever school is not in session. Um, so that's weekends, evenings, um, summertime, every, you know, every time that school is not using it, this community now has a place to gather and get together um, and be outside, which we desperately need right now. Um, all of that, um, not single-handedly because nothing really happens single-handedly, but so much of that came about because Susanna had a vision in her mind and over like 20 years, she worked to bring people together around that vision and to realize that vision. Um, and so that's my, sh my short introduction. Susanna can tell you more about this and we can have a conversation about how all this happened and how we worked together around it. Um, but that to me is one of the things that makes Susanna really extraordinary. Um, so I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Susanna to add whatever she would like to say and, um, and to introduce me. Thank you, Purata. <laughs> Appreciate that. And, and uh, it's very um, exciting to be part of this speakers group and to join all of you and to um, co-host or co-talk co with Purana because um, we have been mischievous together um, in ways that we needed to be in order to get some change done. Um, and as, as my memory recollects, I know that um, part of my, my draw to Purana was certainly first and foremost, um, knowing that she was not only a, a very, um, very committed academic sort of professional program director of Brooklyn College, College Now, which really served in a meaningful way and continues to serve many high school students, helping them have a taste of college classes and 
uh, a window into the adult world ahead on college. And um, she, uh, as we met, I first perhaps met you, Piranha, through her advocacy work, trying to save what was then a, a large Brooklyn College campus garden that was um, under threat of being completely um, removed and a parking lot put in. And um, as I was just a block away, trying to also preserve or um, work with the community to create some open space that would be lasting for the community, she was doing the same kind of advocacy work. And um, it's, it's a tough road to hoe and you're better off with some good friends. <laughs> That's all I can say because um, her persistence um, and her, her doggedness uh, I, I don't know if I can say publicly how much you fought uh, Brooklyn College administration and pushed back um, and students, you galvanized students to protest the raising of this amazing community garden, school campus garden um, for cars at a time when climate change was beginning to ramp up. Um, and um, the, the victory was that there was a compromise forced um, where um, half of the, the entire garden was destroyed and then half of it was repaved for parking spots. And then the other half, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Karana, had to be completely sort of replanted. Um, the, the, the half of the community campus garden that was saved. Um, so that was a huge fight and that certainly got my attention because Karana was a big piece of that leadership. And um, then also she was experiencing, um, as she's running Brooklyn College, College Now programs, she also um, had started an amazing program, which I don't, even, I don't even understand the full depth of it, but I've attended a few of her classes. Uh, but the, the gist of it is, I think for Brooklyn College, the first um, community roots program, I, and Piana, you do have a new title for it now, I'm not sure, um, but it's always been engaged, uh, engaged uh, high school students, at least 22, every summer for eight week training program in sustainability farming. And Piana created this. And it's the first creation and manifestation of an urban farming program connected to uh, emanating from, from Brooklyn College campus and connecting into the high school college age group to uh, really help uh, expose people to hands-on experiences in sustainability issues, uh, environmental justice, uh, eco-justice, farming, sustainability, food justice. Um, there's not, there wasn't a lot of that going on at the time and it, it's all risen to the surface over the last 10 years, but she had a vision and she, she this, this course, except for this one last year pandemic uh, has been, is at least 10 to 12, 15 years old. And um, to me, the, the tremendous amount of, um, grace and persistence and devotion to uh, that Purana has shown to working with youth, college age students and deeply connecting to her own community. We all live in this same community um, and helping expose um, people to professions that from my experience, I, I've been trained in the New York Botanical Garden. I've worked at the Botanic Gardens for a good 10 plus years in the past. Um, and I'm now a private line, landscaper and, the, the, and a public landscaper. Um, but uh, what I have noticed throughout my entire career is how few opportunities there are for students to um, be aware of and, and find out about the whole greening um, career opportunities that are out there connected to the eco justice issues. And Purata is doing that. And um, with the school yard, she was also um, seeking additional space to have a, um, some farm training locations, um, gardening space for the summers. And that's where we connected in the first um, 
sort of, I think around 2010 or 2011. And sure, I was starting the school garden with the principal's um, approval, but uh, it, it, it really was uh, a moment where Tarana and I said, well, uh, she needs land and I need people to be in this schoolyard because the principals were just not bringing their teachers out. They were not interested. It was, it's been an afterthought, this entire open space for 25 years. Uh, and I don't say that to denigrate administrators. They're busy trying to educate students inside college and inside their buildings, but they um, often forget that there's a lot of informal, important informal learning that can take place out in a classroom. So Puran and I uh, in, intersected in these ways. And um, she, uh, you know, I do need to say in the midst of all of this, she has been a graduate student and I want to congratulate her for having finished her PhD just less than two months ago, having run the BC, the Brooklyn College College Now program, been involved with um, supporting um, students um, through community roots and also jumping in on the participatory budget process, which um, was very key where she helped galvanize students to help bring out the vote for schoolyard funding, which um, was uh, a key step in 2016 to uh, fight for in order to um, finally get some funds to renovate this very neglected space. Um, we do have some photographs, um, which will show some of the context of this, but um, really looking forward to talking more uh, about this process and, and connecting to all of you regarding your questions and interests in what kind of advocacy drives you. Um, my biggest thing would be to say, I think Piran and I have made it this far because um, we haven't given up and we've also really appreciated that it's a group effort to create change and to listen to each other and guide it, um, not in a top-down fashion at all, but to um, listen and work together and hear what the collective needs are and to collectively say, it's not okay that this, uh, this problem, whether it's open space or um, food issues, uh, that it remain unsolved given all the resources and uh, talent in the world um, and to change the systems. So, uh, and I also wanna say it's, it's been a joy working with Pirano because there have been some low, low moments where I've wanted to walk away. <laughs> And I don't think if I'd known, uh, I started this process in 1995. Uh, as Pirata said, we had to protest that the schoolyard at the time was a parking lot for Midwood High School teachers. And the animosity still continues today. Midwood staff have not, uh, some of them forgotten that they lost their parking spaces. And that's reflected in the way um, the community has been treated in the future. Um, so, those um, uh, aspects of uh, fighting the resistance um, come with some tough moments, but um, easier to uh, ride them out as a group than alone. <laughs> so, Purana, you wanna? Sure. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to just ask Salita, because um, I think you have a feel for how these talks have been going. Um, would should we take a break for questions or should we go into our photos and um, contextualize some of what we've been talking about a little more that way or what, what would you suggest i would suggest you have a bit of time if you feel like contextualizing to give us more information before we ask questions that'd be great great okay mm -hmm. thanks so i'm going to share my screen and i'm going to show you all hopefully this is going to come up are you seeing my screen so i'm going to share a little bit about um, the history we were talking about with Community Roots, um, the program that I run that Susanna mentioned um, at Brooklyn College, and also the Brooklyn College Garden History, um, which I think um, is kind of interesting. Um, so I'm going to actually start with this photo. So 
if you have been to Brooklyn College campus, you may recognize this as Brooklyn College campus. <laughs> this is um, looking from Avenue H at the um, security booth, more or less, to the athletic field. Campus Road is on your left. And this is back in around, I don't know, probably 1994 or something like that, um, when we were excavating this grassy area on the edge of the athletic field. Um, because we had started a community garden. This is community members, um, neighbors of mine, my landlords that I was living with up in a little attic apartment um, right near Brooklyn College. Um, and we had built that on a, a vacant lot that was across the street from Brooklyn College. You can, I don't think you can quite see it, but it would be all the way over on the left. If you walk down Campus Road now, you can see these kind of two um, connected houses right there on that corner that don't look like the rest of the houses. And that's because they were built there after the developer, which um, bought the lot from um, Banco Popular, I think, owned it, uh, built those houses. And the bank was really, really happy that we cleaned up their lot for them. They, it looked really nice. They sold it to developers after two years and we didn't have a garden. And now we had like 40, 40 community members who were growing vegetables and flowers. And we were used to having barbecues and gatherings and parties out there. And uh, my landlady was connected to Brooklyn College. And so she convinced the president at the time, um, President Latin, to allow us to excavate this grassy area that they weren't using. And um, we remained there. So we did this by hand, as you can see, laying down garbage cans to keep the, I mean, garbage bags to keep the weeds down, um, sa salvaged bricks that we found at construction sites. We're building paths there. Um, you know, we pulled up the sod by hand, basically. Um, and uh, we built this, this amazing garden and gathering space. Um, and this is our group a couple of years after. Um, this is a small snapshot of neighbors kind of having a gathering there at the garden. You can see that it's really been um, transformed. The space has been transformed. That's looking towards Avenue H and Campus Road there. Um, that is like a much younger person with the same name that I have planting things in that garden. Um, and there we are again. And you could actually see me in the background. We're having a gathering at the garden. Um, I think I'm presenting about composting at Brooklyn College's one of our um, Earth Days there. This, um, this happened, we moved to Brooklyn College at the same time that I was um, more or less at the same time that I was hired to, to run college now, to direct college now. So I was suddenly working with high school students. And I thought to myself, I wonder if high school students would have as much fun as I am with my friends and my neighbors working in this garden. So I started to just informally invite people to come and garden with us in the summer. And, you know, sure enough, it, it took off. Um, people wanted to come, they wanted to spend time there. I started, you know, developing activities, developing a sort of curriculum. Um, we, you know, started growing fruits and vegetables and learning about them. I don't know why that happened there. Um, oh, wait a minute, our photos went out of order. Let me see if I can get to the next one. Yeah, um, just to show you that it was a very intergenerational um, community that grew around. I think um, that's my godson's sister there. Um, we started branching out and taking care of the trees on Campus Road. Um, we started visiting um, places around New York City and even outside of New York City where um, people were doing really interesting work around food and farming. Um, and as Susanna said, knowing that the concept of sustainability was becoming very, um, you know, it was becoming part of the public conversation, I started to conceive it as a sustainability program. Um, and I started to think, as Susanna said, how to develop it um, into an even more formal program so that I could get um, recognition at Brooklyn College that it was an official program, that it was entitled to be there. Um, and, um, you know, that we weren't kind of like squatters because that's kind of how um, the campus uh, thought of us. So around 2010, um, the new administration at Brooklyn College 
decided that they needed more spots um, for parking, for parking cars on campus. And that's when they told us that we had to leave uh, Brooklyn College. They told the gardeners, all of us, that we had to leave. Um, because my program had become an official CUNY program with a budget and enrollments and everything else, they actually tried to make me break ranks with the rest of the gardeners. They said, we'll give you a spot to run your program on campus, but we won't let the community members continue being on campus. And I was not very savvy at the time, but I knew I was not comfortable with that. Um, and so I, I turned them down and, and we kind of thought we were all gonna just have to leave. But there were some people in our group who said, no, you know, we should really make this campus, this administration, think about the contribution that we're making, especially given how important sustainability is gonna be in the next um, you know, decades, um, how, how much of reality climate change is, we know this. And people actually started coming forward, Brooklyn College students, um, Brooklyn College faculty, members of the community like Susanna, people started to really come to our defense. Um, and uh, our story made it into the newspapers. And um, some of the stories were not very kind to Brooklyn College. This, mm. this photo is not what I wanted to show you. Well, I don't know what happened to the other article, but this is just like to show you that we were at that point doing a whole bunch of different kinds of activities, um, seed saving, presenting at conferences about our experiences. This is me and a couple of the students who returned as mentors in the program, presenting at an educational research conference. Um, this is one of our former students, Alyssa, who worked with both Susanna and me and began an internship with an organization called Teens for Food Justice and continued in that field and became um, a, an aquaponics farm manager and is a sustainability major at Brooklyn College. Some of you may know her, she's finishing up this year. And this is me and Susanna when we first met. This is after Brooklyn College um, won the lawsuit that our garden group brought against the administration. Um, Brooklyn College immediately raised the campus road garden where we had been for 14 years. They raised it to the ground. And the next day they put um, a press release on their website saying that they were going to build the first ever college garden at CUNY, um, which it wasn't because I think there was already one at Kingsborough. But their point was that they were at the forefront of the sustainability movement and they were gonna build the first garden there was no mention of the fact that there was a garden there that they had just raised to the ground. Um, I wanna say that a lot of really great things happened out of that because so many faculty came forward and they cared about it. We suddenly had a sustainability faculty task force who created a sustainability major at Brooklyn College. We had a sustainability council that started looking at how we could green our campus and make it more um, we could improve, you know, energy use, we could improve education around um, environmental uh, issues on campus and so on. And, um, but at the same time, Community Roots and, and myself, we, we were not welcome at the Brooklyn College Garden because we had been on the wrong side of that battle. So, mm -hmm. so that's when Susanna said to me, and here we are standing right in it, there's this schoolyard at across from Midwood High School and I'm trying to get a garden started there and I want to apply for participatory budgeting money. Um, why don't you and your students kind of get involved in this effort? You know, you can help us lay the groundwork. Um, you can have a place to do an amazing amount of gardening education and uh, I can help teach them everything I know as a landscaper. And I was like, great, sure. So this is um, a photo of us from an article that appeared that year, 2010, when we were first applying for participatory budgeting funds. And I'm gonna turn it over to Susanna because um, at this point, we started to have um, our kind of makeshift gardening effort going on. And Susanna was kind of um, leading that. So do you wanna talk about what's happening here, Susanna? Sure, um, thank you, Pirana. Um, I'm learning a lot more about the behind the scenes of the campus garden. Thank you. <laughs> it's like, shame on them. Anyway, uh, that's another story. Um, 
Yeah, so we uh, basically had to mobilize um, and none of this happens easily there. You're looking at um, the building behind the truck is Midwood High School, which even though they lost the parking lot, they never gave up control of the playground, which um, specifically is supposed to serve the elementary schools on the opposite side of um, the playground, PS 152 and 315. So there's a lot of, um, there were three principles that I had to deal with to always get to suggest get permission to put in the school garden, uh, do a community build to get permission for uh, Green Thumb to bring in truckloads of soil. Um, what you're looking at actually is a, uh, the results of a million dollar playground that was put in in 1994. And they only really, um, uh, you, you see the side of this area. There's an opposite side equivalent, um, really two thirds of the entire schoolyard. Um, they had planted shrubs. They, they, when they lost the parking lot, school construction authority and Midwood High School um, for a million dollars, someone must've walked off with some money because um, you're looking at um, a barren site where then the community, uh, me in particular with this um, scene had to, mobilized to get soil brought back in because it was, um, the shrubs had been pulled out and um, because it was designed for children. And that was something for kids to do. There were no play structures. Um, and built to um, not only uh, address sinking property, but also to give soil for um, raised beds to be built. Um, part of the participatory budget process involved um, rallying community and Midwood High School students to vote. Um, and parents, community residents of Flatbush, um, students uh, were all part of the process of proposing um, the schoolyard funding and then trying to get a vote out to get half a million dollars. Um, this is a little bit of a, a of a series of photographs that show the result of the community gardening build before we won half a million dollars. Um, there are students that are in a Flatbush Development Corporation farm training program that I've run for the last 10 years. It's an after school program. And the notion of building the garden was if you build it, they will come. And yes, um, the after school students have been an uh, integral part of farming these raised beds along with Piranha's program and um, drop-in visitors. Um, to the far bottom left is uh, Garden to Cafe, an entire Department of Ed um, program supporting school gardens in school yards and um, connecting it to nutrition. And the, the map up at the top, it's, it's a little crude, but basically in my working with um, starting three school gardens in the Flatbush area, um, and meeting Piranha made me understand that there's a flow, uh, you know, of course, of neighborhoods. We all flow across neighborhoods to get things or to go to institutions, and that there are feeder corridors, which, you know, we're calling green corridors of students that were all flowing to PS 152 and 315 for summer school and summer camp. And so the idea was to have consistent farming experiences. K to college and beyond. And this is something I've been promoting since 2012. Piran and I have talked about it constantly. How can we expect to save the earth if children and our neighborhoods and people don't have a chance to be in nature all the time and be nurtured by it, to be wondered, wondrous by it, to do science, to plant, to grow, and that our neighborhoods, if they're devoid of these green spaces, um, it's short circuiting really, not just physical survival, because we know the planet's under huge stress now, but for mental and emotional reasons, we, we have a right to these spaces and to, to demand them and create them. So the corridor, you know, we're not done yet. But this is um, a photograph of before shot of the schoolyard at the top right. 
and then an after, uh, which is a result of the renovation and um, uh, really a 20 year experience of the community trying to raise money for um, to fully renovate the schoolyard. The plan on the left is designed with community input. Uh, we, as well as student input at PS 152 and 315, um, because we had been so disappointed by school construction authority 12, 15 years ago by what they put in, um, we demanded that Trust for Public Land, which is a nonprofit, be a working partner and uh, do a community school design process where the voices and the needs of the students and the residents would be uh, reflected in the design. What do we want to see there? So um, when we won half a million dollars through the participatory budget process in 2016, um, we, we said as a group, we, we established, we had to call our group something and our group was um, Purana, students, parents, community residents, um, security guards, people, everyone who lived in the neighborhood, we called ourselves a schoolyard working group. And I know we were the biggest pain in the butt to the principals, uh, and even to our elected leader, Jamani Williams at the time was our wonderful council district leader. And we won the half a million, but we also said, Jamani, you got to hold it. You got to hold that half a million for us because that is not enough money to properly really renovate this space. So um, he was willing to go to school construction authority and say, this is the community's money for this playground. You have 18 months, you have to don't touch it because this is what happened last time in 1990, I don't know, 1998, we won a million dollars and we lost it all before renovation was supposed to take place back then due to the recession. So um, Rodney B. Schott, our community member, uh, community assembly member helped raise uh, 1.3 million to um, get us towards 2 million. What you're looking at here are some of the choices that came out of the design process. These are our students that are from PS 152 that actually did a field trip to Trust for Public Land design playground. You see all these green dots. This is where community members and students, there were two different design processes where you would take your dots and you would choose um, what your first, second, third, and fourth, fifth, and sixth choice of um, what do you what do you like to what would you like to see in the schoolyard? So it was a very democratic process uh, of having really the community and, and students um, be engaged in the, in the design of their new their new playground. This is a field trip to one of the completed Trust for Public Land um, playgrounds nearby, and you notice the hoop, which is. Um, there was a bit of a, a tassel with the head of Midwood High School, since they controlled the property, they made it very clear they did not want any hoops. And um, they said this several times to, to our parent group. And then after we won half a million dollars, they said it again in front of Rodney B. Short, our assembly member and other elected officials. And she asked them why. And they said, said, well, it will attract gang. And we, all the overtones, all the racial overtones were very obvious. And um, she shot back. She said, this is very interesting you say that, but this is, um, if you were to have hoops in Long Island, why are not there hoops here? And hoops are the number one choice, which they were, which all the students had rated their first choice to have in the schoolyard. And um, we were up against some very uh, distinct power plays by the principal that controlled the property and had to go above his head several times on the hoops and also a, a garden shed he tried to tear down. This is the group of students, that P, a select group of 152, 315 students who were in a five session design process on the far right is our elected leader, Rodney B. Schott, who has been an amazing ally um, for the schoolyard and has and grew up in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, as they go to this 
brand new playground, these students get ideas about what they want to bring back to the design session and add to their the playground design process. So that's that was the value of seeing um, what a playground could be like. Um, this goes back to um, a very humble build where you saw the soil truck at the start of the show or start of the slides. Um, and this is a, a community group where we built, we had to build fencing to prevent balls from supposedly injuring students in the garden. Uh, we built raised beds. This is all support, uh, supported by Green Thumb, three supplies. If anyone in this group is ever, you know, looking to do something similar, um, feel free to call Pure RRI because we, there are many free sources, resources. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? I can't un unmute. I mean, I can't see my screen right now. Yes, you, you can are. hear me. So, so with it, thank you. With this um, photo of Alyssa thinking about this, literally she is thinking about what is going to be in that um, Midwood Garden during the visioning session. I'm thinking maybe we'll go to our questions and answers. And I'll continue scrolling through photos um, in case anything else interesting comes up. But does anyone have questions? You can put them in the chat or unmute yourselves and just ask. Um, well, he had just um, entered a question in the chat. Um, here, would you like to read it yourself? No, um, okay, I'll, I've got it. So he asked, how did you manage to maintain the garden during I the pandemic? I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> That's fine, go ahead. Yeah, that that was um, well. First of all, the the renovation of the new schoolyard started in August two thousand nineteen. So um, everything was on schedule by January twenty twenty. Um, so everything was miraculously on schedule. That's part of the best thing about working for Trust for Public Land because it's all women. They are the general contractors. They manage all the vendors and they have a long history with each other. Um, so any vendor that doesn't um, do accordingly in a timely way, um, they'll get off this list and won't be used again. And um, so the problem is that with the pandemic, everything shut down. And as, as everyone knows, as we went into from March into June, we began to understand, okay, socially distancing outside is safer than being indoors. And there were huge, Food and security issues that continue to be, and we were. I was calling Trust for Public Land relentlessly to say, it does not look good. You have finished this playground. It's July now. Children are desperate to oh, to play. There's no. This is locked up. It's a two million dollar playground that's locked up in a pandemic. We need out. The children need it. Other neighborhoods have access to their playgrounds. There's Prospect Park what's the problem? And they said, well, you know, we need to have a big opening with Governor Cuomo because he gave a ton of money and we don't know his schedule. So there were a lot of behind the scenes battles to um, first get them to relent. So July 14th, um, both Purana had students that had lost their internships uh, due to the pandemic or weren't going to connect community roots summer program because everything was shut down. Brooklyn College Sustainability Institute interns had lost their internships due to the pandemic. So uh, there were students from both of those camps that we had permission to come in and plant. And this is what this is a picture of, prep the soil, um, get some food growing. And then uh, um, the maintenance was uh, with interns, college interns, Puranas, high school interns, uh, community residents, a combination. And um, it was, we got a lot done. But, but, and we watered. And then we had to go for a second round of fighting with Trust for Public Land and the schools because they still refused to open the park. We were just going privately to go. And um, that was not a pretty scene, but um, they were still trying to preserve 
the guard, a principal and another person at Trust for Public Land. And they felt they were worried the community would um, destroy is not the word, but vandalize this brand new space before the governor showed up for an opening. I did do not. So but it did, it did eventually oh, open. Well, well, anyway. And it, it did. did eventually open it and did. that's what you're seeing. Yeah. You're seeing Susanna welcoming like the first group of families. Um, we, I think this, this was a day um, shortly after opening, we had a plant giveaway. You see children walking off with um, little seedlings that we've prepared with them. And um, you know, you can see how vastly that space has been transformed um, from when we were digging our own beds a few years ago to you know then having these empty beds um, six months uh, before the thing opened. And then um, by the time it opened, really, you know, having a real garden and playground. Do we, do, are there other questions? I see that we're, we're kind of um, coming up on time. Yes, we actually do. So a bit of two first. So we want an Andrea wants to know, um, how do students get involved? And specifically adding on to Safong's question, how can you know us at the squad be able to go and check out the the garden right now? Well, yeah, anytime. Um, yeah. yeah, that that involved. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. That that garden, as I said, is open to the community anytime school is not in session, and the schools are not using it this summer. So every day of the week, from you know sun up to basically sundown. Um, that garden is full of people, the garden and the playground. Um, so you can go there, you know, seven days a week. Um, if you're a student who wants to get involved in a more formal way, um, college now um, recruits high school students to take a college credit class now associated with that community roots course. It's called General Science 2050. Um, and it's an environmental studies course in eco justice is how we frame it. And it's got um, a very strong hands-on component. Even this year, we're offering a hands-on component. Um, and it's also got um, an academic component. Um, and Susanna will eventually, I'm sure, be running after school programming there again um, for younger students yeah. and, and also brings on people to help with the stewardship sometimes. Yeah. And if I can just tack on there, um, Please. definitely um, I'm working with intern um, summer uh, who has a formal in internship and will be um, we're coordinating volunteers with watering. And there is an opportunity. Um, we water technically Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the mornings. And if anyone wants certainly to visit the garden and or get an experience of doing some gardening on an informal basis. Um, they're welcome to contact me and um, we can figure out some time that might link up and you get some exposure if you just want to check it out um, yeah. or just come by. It's often, it's, I don't know how many people live near the neighborhood, but as Purana said, it's open dawn to dusk. Uh, there are no locks to the garden. And if one is interested in learning about gardening and joining some of the watering and tasks of maintenance, um, we, we will, uh, we're doing that. To keep it going yeah. we have also, some cow manure to spread we need help <laughs> <laughs> oh good let me i i want to get my students involved in that um okay. i want to <laughs> i want to just tack on too before i forget because i promised i would tell you all about this what you're looking at right now is the brooklyn college garden the um, composting area mm -hmm. um two years ago summer 2019 um, by then, Community Roots was kind of allowed back in the Brooklyn College Garden, and we had a really nice partnership with the manager. Um, that garden, as you may know, has been closed since the campus closed in March of 2020. And it is now overgrown to the point where you could not even be standing in that area by the compost because there are weeds like six feet high throughout the whole garden. That being said, Susanna is going to be co-teaching um, a sustainability course in the fall with a gardening practicum that meets on Friday mornings. And I think there's still two or three spaces open in that course. So if you're a Brooklyn College student or a CUNY student looking for an extra class to take, um, if sustainability could fit into your um, electives or your major, um, or if you just wanna take this, this class, it's gonna be so exciting. And 
those students who take that class with Susanna are going to pave the way for that garden to come back into use again, because right now there's no garden manager, the garden is closed and the college is saying that nobody can go in that garden, despite the fact that we all need the outdoor space. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that it's a huge resource to the campus. So, you know, um, we will share our contact info um, in the chat and please get in touch with one of us if you're interested in registering for that class. It's going to be great. Community involvement, student involvement, that's great. And I'm glad that there's no locks on the garden because that's always important to, um, you know, help the feeling of the, the community ownership over, over a garden and participation and like, the, um, you know, the, that the garden's open right now. Um, so we have another question uh, from Karina. Karina, would you like to say? Hi, everyone. Um, my question um, kind of revolves around advocacy, especially when it comes to spaces like the, and the way we use spaces. Like when it comes to Prospect Park, there's like a, a lot of issues around barbecuing and where you can and can't barbecue and who has the right to that space and who has the right to do that. So um, how do we advocate for green spaces for all without like the issue of harassment and like worrying about the police being called on you? Oh, you know, I used to work for Prospect Park. That's a great question um, in, the, in the volunteer department for Prospect Park Alliance. And um, I, I went by uh, one of the barbecue spaces just this weekend, which was had a lovely tons of tables and some really nice party going on. And um, from your, uh, I'm not quite sure if they typically um, still require permits for people 50 and, you know, 50 or more people at a time, but um, are you finding that some of the areas aren't accessible because um, park ranger comes around and says you can't be here um, with the barbecue? I'm more like, I don't know if you ever seen those videos of like Karen's following people around like a park and saying like, you can't be here, you can't do that. Oh. Like that kind of um, harassment, not me, not the park, but like more yes. community member harassment. Oh yeah. Um, I, I, I tend to say to keep pushing up against that and report it or um, if, and if it's a persistent problem, which I could see it, it could be, it, at certain times that um, don't back down and, and mobilize assistance to address it because there's absolute, the park is a public park. It was built for everyone. And um, uh, if there's specific experiences that are you know, negating that process or that access, um, definitely report it and, and mobilize for, for help. I would say. Tirana, do you have any response to that or? Yeah, I mean, I understand. I definitely understand the question because I, I just see on my, on my neighborhood listserv, I see all the time people who live near the park complaining about all, ki all kinds of things that are happening in the park, noise complaints, smoke complaints. Um, and, you know, there is definitely a lack of awareness of, um, you know, other people's perspective, the fact that it is a public park, the fact that it is a public place, the fact that, uh, you know, everybody doesn't have a backyard to barbecue in. Um, mm -hmm. And the problem is that a lot of times the, the people who are making the complaints are the ones that feel comfortable going to like the NYPD, the local precincts, um, like community affairs officer and making their perspective known. Um, whereas, you know, maybe some of the people who are coming to the park, let's say to barbecue or, or whatever, um, may not. And it is, it is a really big problem. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, except that I think for me, what I see that I find encouraging is that I see these, I, I don't, I don't want to use that, um, I don't want to use the K word, um, but, you know, I see these, these folks coming on the listserv and saying these things, and I see other people coming on the listserv and, and trying like very, um, I don't want to say diplomatically, like skillfully to, to try to help people see other people's perspectives without making them feel attacked or defensive and, and so on. Um, because I think it's, you know, it's very, 
it's very easy to shut down when you feel attacked because you know you did something that was tone deaf and that wasn't right. Um, so it's it's hard to um, it's it's hard to navigate those conflicts in community. But that's the thing. I mean, that's why we have to be we have to be talking. We have to have spaces where we can talk about these things mm -hmm. in classrooms. In you know, in high school classes, like in community roots, this is something we talk about all the time. But right. there is no place in the high school or college curriculum where you have these conversations. Um, and there is no place in our communities where we're having these conversations in a way that's meant to, to build um, trust, unless you're somebody who's actively looking for it. So I say we have to be like actively looking for it and we have to build it. And, and Carol, that's, that's, I just want to add to um, while you were talking, saying um, there from the beginning, Priyana and I were also saying there's just strength in numbers. And if you're you, your friends or others are obviously there's a pattern of this. You can see it recorded on Facebook postings, whatever. But one of the things I learned with advocating for the schoolyard and I consider myself more of a shy person, uh, not liking this, but I would walk into my assembly member's office. I would go to the council district member who serves me or our neighborhood and say, this is the problem. We have no open space. If you consider, if a group of you do go and register the problem with your electeds, they in turn also um, can be asked to put pressure on Prospect Park Alliance, who have plenty of funders that don't want to see these kinds of uh, tightening of who gets to use this public space happen because it's their money to keep it a public space accessible to all. And then also um, to Parks Department and to City Hall to um, to file those complaints. And as Kirana said, it's, it's uncomfortable. Not everyone is gonna do it at all for all kinds of reasons. And if you, uh, or writing a letter, emails, um, getting people to place phone calls to the electeds, to Prospect Park Alliance, to find the people that are, quote, in charge of the space, and usually it's a collection, and bother them with this very relevant um, problem and and try not to feel like um, it won't catch on them because there are people that are in your camp that are in those positions that will uh, that are paid to respond to that and not all will come forward immediately some will but um, to or, or to talk with others um, if you want to get um, some tips or, or um, support in doing that. Um, Thank you. Happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you for that very um, in-depth answer. We have unfortunately only time for one more question. Um, and that is from uh, Brianna. Do you want to ask it? Brianna? I think I answered Brianna's oh, question. So I saw I did see Brianna's question, which is what um, how to get a plot in the garden. And I just wanted to met, say that there are two gardens. One is the Midwood High School garden that Susanna and I are working in now, and that doesn't have individual plots, um, but you can definitely get involved in it. Um, I don't know, you know, if you plant something there, somebody else might harvest it. It's not kind of that kind of garden. Um, the Brooklyn College Garden is closed right now, but after Susanna and Mike's class um, um, gets done with it, we hope in the fall, uh, it will resume taking members by lottery, um, which is how Brooklyn College assigns plots in that garden. Um, and you will also, by the way, if you take that class, you'll be discussing a lot of these issues, how to address these issues in community with Professor Menser um, and with Susanna. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really encourage you to take it if you can um, if these are issues that you're thinking about, about food systems, land in place, um, community building, advocacy, people's movements, individual action and agency, um, you know, that's one place where you can have that conversation at Brooklyn College. Thank you. And for anyone who wants to garden on an individual plot, if there's not one on a public space or in a schoolyard, call us. 
there's there's so many movements now about the street tree strip that's public people are taking that over um people with private small front yards some willing to lend out the first three feet um part of that is the greening corridor idea is to say other communities are doing this by the way around the world and in detroit in england they're just taking over unused public space uh, or private public space by agreement and growing food along with the trees and the shrubs. And so if anyone is hankering to get green and get going, um, call us because neighborhood might have an ideal space and also near Brooklyn College. It could really anywhere. There's a lot of potential and support. <laughs> Well, thank you. And I'm thank so you. glad you guys left your emails in the chat. You guys could, everyone, uh, our students today, make sure you get their information and copy them. Um, so if you have any questions, you can reach out to them. I want to thank Susanna and Periana for being with us here today, for being willing to be so open and, and talk in depth about what they do and you know their passion and the vision that they've been able to bring to life. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here today, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Salita. What Thank a great job you us. did. Um, and thank you for sharing, uh, Pirana and Susanna, sharing your experiences. Um, I'm sure you're going to get some uh, queries from our students. I hope everyone has a nice afternoon. I'll see everyone at 12 o'clock uh, tomorrow when we're going to hear from a representative of the um, Academic Advising Office at Brooklyn College. So um, take care, everyone. And thanks again to my guests and to Salita, the host. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Salita. Bye. Bye. Thank you.